Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So I, I will uh, briefly touch upon, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, very yeah. well. Uh, we, I'll briefly touch upon the technique of open screw fixation in displaced factors and I'll just take my talk to exactly this. So this is the area that I'm going to talk about, the middle third area. Fortunately, this is the area where maximum scaphoid fractures happen. And this is the area which is the most richly supplied uh, by uh, blood. So the healing is lesser of an issue as compared to the proximal pole. When this area was studied by CT scan in this paper long ago by Dr. Nakamura, there, was a, there were some interesting findings. So when the fracture lines happened in the distal third of the waist fracture, I'm not talking about the distal third of the scaphoid, it's the distal third of the waist. And just for orientation, we are talking about dorsal and volar. So uh, this is the proximal and this is the distal. When the fracture lines were in the distal third, you, we had a volar offset or volar translation and a rotatory displacement. Whereas when the fracture lines were in the proximal third of the base, then we had a humpback deformity. So, so these are the three deformities that we get. Flexion, as in the humpback deformity, rotation, as in the rotatory translation, and rotatory uh, deformity, and translation, as in the volar offset. Now, not all of all these are very easily uh, visible on the lateral X-ray or only on a tomogram. Sometimes you require a 3D CT scan, and even for CT scan, the inter-observer error is as much as 20% among the surgeons. Therefore, despite best efforts, all three may remain at the end of fixation, and therefore, perhaps, uh, open reduction of a displaced fracture rather than an attempted percutaneous fixation is a better idea. CT scan obviously is useful when you want to treat a fracture conservatively and which uh, looks undisplaced on the X-ray and you want to confirm that it is undisplaced. Yes, fantastic. That's where CT scan counts much over, uh, much better. So how do we def define a displaced scaphoid fracture? Dr. Dias's paper says it's step one millimeter, gap more than one millimeter. If there is a rotation as is seen by an asymmetric gap, if there's an angulation as shown by a humpback deformity, and if there's a dorsal lunar tilt indicating a DC deformity, these are definite indicators of a displaced scaphoid fracture. And these would be definite indications for a surgical fixation as well. Important thing to remember is when you have a displaced fracture, you have about 20% non-union rate. However, even when you operate, the non-union rate still continues to be 7%, which is pretty high. So surgical approach is almost always through a volar uh, approach and through FCR sheet. Uh, dorsal approach is reserved only for the proximal pole factors and for those factors who require a vascularized bone graft. Schematically, this is the, the incision which goes across the wrist crease and uh, goes onto the thinner eminence just on the radial side of the FCR sheet. Once the FCR sheet is divided, then we can either divide the capsule in a longitudinal fashion like this, or we can do a nerve sparing approach uh, described by Mark Garcia Diaz. Uh, with this approach, perhaps the post-op rehabilitation is supposed to be better, better proprioception. So this is how it is done. You you make a make make two flaps between the radioscapocapitate ligament and the radioscapoid ligament. Uh, this is again the scheme and this is the actual exposure through a flap. It's technically difficult because this is a very tiny area. Uh, I haven't been doing it regularly yet. I'm, I'm still quite happy to just divide uh, the uh, ligament longitudinally as long as I can repair it uh, post-operatively. You need to do a good reduction maneuver. Your healing does depend on good reduction and a stable fixation. Compression is a doubtful element in uh, healing, uh, predicting the healing. So there are two important maneuvers for reduction. One is an indirect reduction and second is the volar joysticks. I'll just go through to take you through the scheme of reduction. This is a typical lateral view of the uh, wrist. And these are your bones. They are self-explanatory. And these are the 
uh, bones that we are going to look at. And when you have a waist fracture, this is what we are talking about. Now, typically, even an acute waist fracture typically goes through some amount of purple collapse, where, whereby you start getting a humpback deformity, the lunate starts looking up. Now, if you want to reduce this effectively, you, you need to correct the dorsal angulation or the dorsal looking uh, unit with that the proximal fragment of the uh, scaphoid is also looking dorsally. So the steps for this is you start with former flexing the wrist thereby correcting the lunet alignment and in this position you insert a K wire to fix the lunet to the radius. Now you are in effect fix the proximal pole of the scaphoid in that situation. And now you dorsiflex the wrist again, now which brings the dorsal distal fragment into an alignment. Now, once you have got this, now you need to make a choice of your fixation, whichever you want to. Joystick is typically done for through a volar approach. Now the, the, the wrist is reversed. This is dorsal, this is volar. We put one K wire into the distal fragment, one K wire into the proximal fragment. And we use the joysticks to correct not only the flexion of the scaphoid, but also the rotation. And once, once an alignment is achieved, then we choose a particular method of fixation. My choice of fixation is a screw fixation over a K wire fixation. It gives a, 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 a very stable uh, fixation. The entry point is an important aspect to get the screw perfectly into the scaphoid. So as well, there, 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 there is a very interesting uh, paper. Uh, it says that the, the trajectory of the screw, which gives you the longest screw in the scaphoid may not necessarily be the best trajectory. In fact, uh, the trajectory, the yellow lines in this diagram are the ones which are, par which are perpendicular to the factor line. These are, this is where you want to get. And green is the longest one. So the longest screw is not necessarily the best screw. You, your trajectory, you should choose a trajectory in such a way that you get as close to perpendicular to the fracture side as possible. So for that, you need to do, do not hesitate to open the split open the STT joint in order to get the best entry point. In my practice, removal of part of the trapezium has almost, I'll just skip these examples. Uh, so it is, it is very important when you're putting the implant to know your implant very well. There are, there are two, there are three varieties of implants that are possible. One is a classical Herbert screw where the compression is uh, caused only when the proximal threads start engaging the bone fragment because it works on the principle of differential pitch. Whereas the HCS, which is the deputynthesis screw, headless compression screw works the compression is achieved only until the proximal threads engage. Once the proximal threads start engaging, there is no further compression possible. Remember, this is not a differential pitch. This is simply double helix of the same pitch. And the third one, which is the Acutrac type of screw. Acutrac is not available in India, but the Arthrex a fully threaded screw where compression is achieved throughout the passage of the screw. And once you Once you know your implant well, you will exactly know what is the uh, compression that you need to achieve in your uh, across your fracture. Post operatively, more post screw fixation, I still put them in three weeks of cast if I have got only single screw, and then the patients go on to movements without loading until radiological and uh, clinical healing. Uh, till such time, I put them in a removable splint at least for first three weeks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.